Hello, and thank you for joining me today. My name is Audrey Turley, and I am a senior biocompatibility expert at Nelson Laboratories. Today, I'm going to be presenting biocompatibility of raw materials for medical devices. This is an exciting opportunity for me as typically I spend my time speaking to medical device manufacturers, but there's a lot of consideration that happens before those materials are put into medical devices. So this presentation is really geared toward raw material suppliers and also for medical device companies who need to understand what's appropriate and what to expect and request from their raw material suppliers. So for today, I just wanna give an overview of the presentation. It's gonna be in four sections. The first two sections will be a little lengthy because we are going to talk about the regulations for medical devices and how we can apply those to raw materials. So first we'll talk about the ISO 10993 standards and these are the biocompatibility standards we use to assess medical devices. And then we'll talk about the new MDR and a regulation in there particularly that applies to raw material suppliers. Um, and then we'll talk about who is responsible for testing and then what information and testing on raw materials is useful for medical device companies. So I just wanna give an overview and a reference to the standards that we'll be referencing heavily today. The first one is ISO 10993 part one, 2018 revision. This standard is an overview standard for all of biocompatibility for medical devices. And so this gives us a broad perspective and consideration for biocompatibility and medical devices. This is not available for free on the web, but it is available for purchase from iso.org. And then the MDR regulation. So this is a medical devices regulation in Europe. Um, that is becoming effective slowly over the course of the next five years. They've done some extensions recently, um, but in 2025, uh, this regulation should be fully in place as of you know, current stand, stand on the implementation of the standard. But there's some specific regulation in here that is good to consider upfront and early in the manufacturing of a device. So therefore raw materials is you know, the most applicable place to consider this regulation. And the MDR is available for pre online. It's about 560 pages long, so it's quite lengthy. But if you take this title I have here and pop it into a search bar, it will come up and you can download the PDF version. So let's step into this first portion about 10993-1 and understand how this testing or this concept of biocompatibility applies to raw materials. So I like to put the references in here. This won't be every slide, but I think it's important that we understand where the information is and exactly how it is stated in the standards. It's important to understand that words matter because we're trying to make sure we assess these devices and materials appropriately. So we wanna be as specific as we can about the regulation. So when we try to understand where we sit with assessing raw materials, it really comes from section 4.3 in the standard, where it tells us in the very beginning, you have to think about raw materials for an overall biological evaluation of a medical device. So this section 4.3, part A, says the first thing we're going to consider is the materials of construction. So all materials that have direct or indirect tissue, and I would even say a circulatory contact with the patient, and then any intended additives, process contaminants, and residues. So they give an example here about using ethylene oxide sterilization. Since that happens at the back end after a device is completed, we wanna think about something that's happening more upfront, like plasticizers, or colorants, or processing aids, or um, oils, those types of things that will be used in the manufacture of the raw material even before it gets formed into any type of uh, component for a device. So I like to bring up this table because this is really where medical device companies will go to to understand initially what do we have to think about for our type of device. And you can see in the left-hand column, we think about devices for biocompatibility based on how they contact the patient and then how long they're in contact with the patient. 
So you may be thinking, I'm a raw material supplier. I don't know how these will be contacting a patient, how this material will end up being used specifically, or I want it to apply to a wide range of uses. That's okay. What we really want to focus on is this column here for physical and or chemical information. So this is the first requirement that has to be considered for any medical device for biocompatibility. You'll notice that the other requirement columns and sections are marked with E's, but for the physical and our chemical information, that is marked with an X. If we come to the second part of this table, there's the footnotes at the bottom that explain that X means it's a prerequisite. So this is information you have to gather up front as part of your risk assessment for biocompatibility. And E means, based on the evaluation you gather first, we're going to determine how we're going to assess these other categories. Are they a risk to the patient? Do we have appropriate data from the materials? Um, and, or do we need to step into some testing? So right up front, it is stressed that materials and understanding those materials are very important for a medical device manufacturer. We also have a second place where this is clarified in 10993-1, where this is a flow chart of how we think about a risk assessment for biocompatibility and a risk assessment of, you know, how these materials contact the patient, what do we need to, you know, assess to make sure the patients will be safe. So the very first rectangle here states to obtain device material identification and chemical characterization shall be considered. So not only is the standard saying you have to point out first what your materials are and list all of them um, from a manufacturer's perspective, but you also have to think about if you don't know enough about those materials, you need to step into some chemistry testing. That's more consideration for the finished device and not really a raw material manufacturer consideration but it's important for suppliers of materials to know that this, as much information that can be provided up front, makes you a more valuable business partner as that's less information on the back end that your client has to try to gather through very expensive, you know, tens of thousands of dollars in testing and very time consuming months, up to six months for this testing. So there's two terms that were used in those previous slides. So the first from that table I showed that says physical and chemical information. And then in that last diagram, it said material characterization. So I put up these definitions here. This is to reference after this webinar is over to help you know where to gather more information when you have questions about what this really means. Um, to help us understand that they're almost two of the same thing. You know, physical and chemical information, we're going to gather everything we know up front about this material. So from a raw material supplier, that means providing as much information as you can. And of course, we understand we want to protect that IP, any of your proprietary information. We want to protect that. Um, but we also need to give enough information that your customers can assess that material for its intended use and make sure the patients will be safe. So that's all taken into consideration for this physical and chemical information. When we look at material characterization, it's still gathering specifics about maybe the material in general. So maybe they purchase a, a polypropylene from you as a supplier. And so they're going to get specific information from you as a supplier. Maybe you add a colorant to it. And maybe it's extruded into a tubing before it's um, distributed to your client. They're going to get that type of information up front. And then they're going to say, OK, do we have enough information on the polypropylene for our intended use? And do we need to step into any more chemistry considering you know, how it contacts the patient? So I bring this up. Because it's important, a lot of medical device companies now are thinking, we've got to do this material characterization testing. And I know that they are going to some suppliers and saying, you need to supply this information. It really wouldn't be appropriate at that point in most cases for the supplier to generate that chemistry data as to the extent that the device manufacturer needs it. Now, chemistry information is great about compounds, I think, of what I find on safety data sheets 
and technical specification sheets that helps the engineers and helps the companies know it's, you know, the right material, the right durometer, you know, those considerations. Um, but we're talking more like extractable leachables, you know, to really see what's going to come off of this material. And that would be more appropriate on a final device to really protect patient safety. So this is for information purposes to help guide what should be done and maybe what might be too expensive, expensive for a raw material supplier. So we're going to leave the world of ISO right now. That's just an introduction of how it fits in, why it's so important. We're going to touch back on that again at the end when we talk about you know, what testing and what data is valuable. Um, and now we, I want to talk about the next place that we'll find regulation for raw materials and where you're hearing maybe some feedback from your customers about needing additional information from you for their product. So again, I like to point to the specifics and since the MDR is 566 pages long, I thought I would point out the specific section. So we're in section 10.4.2. Um, where the requirement is here for these CMRs. So what we're talking about is to understand if there is a material in a medical device that has a carcinogen, a mutagen, or a toxin that's uh, toxic to reproduction above 0.1% by weight. Um, they also include in here some substances that have endocrine disrupting properties. You think of like phthalates. And um, so those class of compounds are not to be included in medical devices that are distributed in the EU above 0.1% by weight. And if they are present, then a justification has to be um, performed. And then the guidance, the MDR gives guidance on how to walk through that justification and how you have to talk about it. So this is where the location is for that specific requirement. And I would be surprised if those of you listening, if there weren't a good number of you who have already had you know, um, clients come back to you and say, hey, do you have a certificate, a CMR certificate? And really they're asking to know, do you, can you tell me whether there's any CMRs in this material that I purchased from you? So we have the foundation of that request. Let's talk about some specifics. Okay, where, how does this apply to devices? So when we think about medical devices, again, from a biocompatibility perspective, we're always thinking about how does the device contact the patient? So in this case, the CMR requirement applies to devices with direct and indirect invasive contact, meaning it has to go inside the body. So Examples of that are IV tubing, surgical tools, implants, or even like a breathing tube, because that is delivering, that is a gas pathway, delivering air into the patient. So devices where the CMR does not, CMR requirement does not apply are wearable devices. So devices only with intact skin contact. So I think about, you know, um, maybe a, a heart rate monitor that can be worn or like an oximeter or a blood pressure cuff those things that are only on intact skin. And of course, typically brief contact, even if it's repeated throughout um, the care of the patient. Okay, where do we find, <clears throat> excuse me, the list of CMRs? So the MDR gives us a list right in the um, requirement. It says category 1A or 1B in accordance with part three of Annex 6 to Regulation, you know, 1272. So that's very wordy, but it is a list um, that ha it's a, a harmonized list uh, of label a classification and labeling of hazardous substances from ETRA. And I've put the link in here um, that you can uh, type into your web browser as well. So the, this is a great list. It's all inclusive, um, but the one thing is, is it has more compounds that are not considered CMRs on the list. So if you think about it, you may say, okay, here's all the compounds that are used in our raw material. And if you go look on that list, you may see several of them match, but they aren't technically a CMR, and so they aren't under that requirement. So if you use this list, you do need to filter it out uh, to just CMRs. 
There are some alternate lists. So these are things that I see, of course, on SDS sheets and on technical specification sheets. And I've had um, raw material suppliers companies ask before, is this enough? Can we say we're, you know, we um, meet all the REACH requirements or we're Prop 65 certified? And so I put those lists here with just an explanation for where they fall short. So for REACH, it is a broad set of chemicals um, for various human and environmental impacts, but it's not specific enough to address the CMR requirements. And then Prop 65 is a list of compounds that are known to cause cancer or reproductive toxicity, except that does not include mutagens. So it's not inclusive enough. And then there's a Cosing Annex 2 list, which is a prohibited cosmetic ingredients list. Um, and these compounds are already included in the reference list in the CMR for Annex 6. So our recommendation is to use this list from the NDR that they reference, but to filter it out um, from the CMRs for, for only the CMRs. So that's how we use um, this list um, and have found it quite beneficial for this analysis. So how can companies address CMRs? Again, this is a requirement for a medical device manufacturer, but I wanna lay out the scenarios here of what they're faced with by the time they have a finished device. So the best practice to meet the direct intent of the MDR is that the supplier will provide a certificate um, stating whether there are CMRs present above 0.1% by weight. This is a way for suppliers to protect their own IP and this document can be generated in-house by the supplier or of course they can contract that work out but it's totally controlled by the supplier. An alternate option for medical device companies is that they can try a high level screening chemistry test. This is not as an appropriate or direct way to meet the MDR because it's based on patient exposure. So we're just talking about what leaches out of the device or out of the product, but the MDR requirements are asking them to assess what it is made from, you know, look at the materials, not just the finished device, just everything that makes up that device, you know, the materials. And so we don't know if that alternate option is fully accepted by the notified bodies because we haven't had enough of them review these yet, as they're just now coming on board with MDR certification and reviewing this requirement. Another option that I didn't put here because we don't recommend it is that the medical device manufacturer can completely digest the materials and get all of the information as well. It's, it's very expensive, very costly, and because medical devices are always a mixture, right? It's rarely one type of material. So digesting those materials individually can be quite expensive and lengthy. So we're hoping for cooperation from raw material suppliers and also a little bit of outside the box thinking from the notified bodies to help get this requirement met. So how would you go about getting a supplier or generating a supplier provided certificate? So as, as a raw material manufacturer, I would review all of my materials, all my tampons that are used to generate, let's just say my polypropylene. I'm going to pull up everything we add in there and I can look at our, our um, all of our company private information and look that up myself. And I'm going to assess those by weight and understand how much we include in each you know, part of our material. And then I'm going to take that list, anything that's above 0.1% by weight, and I'm going to review this uh, CLP Annex 6 list that's already been filtered out, of course, for only CMRs. And then I'm going to generate a CMR statement and I'm either going to say there are no CMRs found in, you know, above 0.1% per by weight found in this material and specify the material. And then I would cite which list I reviewed. Simple as that. If there are some present, that's all you have to note is and a justification for how that aids in the processing. And, and that's it. And you can send it to the, um, your clients. And so, so it's easy to do in that regard. And of course, uh, we have an offering here at Nelson Labs where we can do that. We've already filtered out um, the list from Annex 6 to only include CMRs. And we have reviewed and sent out some certificates for companies 
Um, we do sign, you know, non-disclosure agreements. And as we are not medical device manufacturers ourselves, um, you know, there's not a risk that we'll take this information and do anything with it. And we sign the legal documents. So we're happy to generate this certificate for you and help you get that going and help you get that program installed in your company as well. Okay, this next part, so we're still going to talk more about some testing here at the end, but we'll just talk about, I think it's appropriate to really understand who's responsible for testing. This is a short discussion, um, but I want to give some background to it so that you understand it, not just, you know, memorize it. So we think about medical devices from a raw material perspective, and then we also have to think about this finished device. Um, and what goes into it in between the processes and sterilization. So maybe a raw material that you know will be supplied is just a white polypropylene pellet. Then maybe in that process and sterilization, we've you know added compounds to it so we can make this nested cube. We've also sterilized this with EO sterilization, so now we have some EO residuals we need to consider. Um, from a raw material perspective, where we just look at these pellets on the left side. We're not really seeing, you know, all the processes that go into it for this final finished device. So 10993 part one specifies that biocompatibility testing should be performed on the final, the sterile, if it's sterilized, final product, or of course a representative sample um, that, that will apply to the full finished device. So from a raw material perspective, you do not have a responsibility to test for biocompatibility for that final finished device. Any testing that's done helps your um, clients understand if they're starting with a biocompatible material, which is very, very beneficial. But I just wanted to understand, help understand and draw a line that it's not a requirement. Um, but what is required is that you provide enough information hopefully so that your clients can understand what type of material they're beginning with. So quick discussion on that. Now let's step into what information and testing on raw materials is useful for medical device companies. So again, we step back to this table, we think about this physical and or chemical information, and then we think about how, you know, what's appropriate and how we can address most of these biocompatibility concerns. You can see how many other tests and endpoints need to be considered for medical devices. And it would be very burdensome for a raw material supplier to do all of that work. And also the final finished device would still need to be assessed. So we'd be looking at even repeating some of that work. So let's talk about what I currently see for supplier information. So I will either see something that says ISO 10993 compliance or USP class six. When I see anything that's you know, beneficial for biocompatibility, it's one of these two things. So let's talk about USP class six testing. So this is a requirement that's meant for pharmaceutical closure containers. So we think about containers that are gonna hold drugs or that are gonna hold a liquid antibiotic solution. So this testing, very important because we wanna make sure nothing is coming from those containers and leaching into our medicine. So this testing includes irritation and then acute systemic toxicity where they're looking to make sure that the, this is an in vivo test, meaning it's run in animals. So they'll make sure that the animals survive after being exposed to this material and that they um, have proper weight gain as well. And then we do a seven day implant. Um, this is quite extensive. Uh, of a test as far as just having, you know, a secondary contact with a drug, um, but I'm sure it serves a purpose more for the drug properties than it does um, from like a direct exposure to the product. So although these tests are very informative, um, it's kind of all over the place as far as assessing a device for patient safety. And we'll kind of tie this in after we talk about 10993. So we think about for 10993, if I see a statement that says, well, we're 10993 compliant, I, that doesn't tell me what was performed. There are over 20 ISO 10993 standards, and each one of those standards can have up to three to four different tests that they recommend inside the standards. So 
there's a myriad of combination of tests that could be used. And also, I'm always curious about, well, what did they do with the material before it was sterilized or before it was tested? Does it match what I'm going to do with my material? You know, is it just the raw pellets? Was it extruded? Did they also sterilize it? Um, before it was tested, did they add colorants because they sell it in all these colors? And so I see, you know, medical grade lines of, of raw materials and they'll be offered maybe in several different colors, but then, you know, maybe only one of those is tested and, and that's, that's okay that that's done. It's just good for the medical device companies and myself to understand that approach. So I want to come back to this table now that we're thinking about that. And if we remember about the USP class six. Those tests were irritation, acute systemic toxicity, and implantation. So you can see those in these biological endpoints that are listed here on the left-hand side of this chart. But you can see that there's so many other tests that need to be performed, and that doesn't quite hit it for one type of device contact, meaning that you know even a device that just contacts the intact skin worn on the surface of the body, it's still only addressing irritation that would help your clients. So although it's good information for pharmaceutical containers, I don't find it as relatable for medical devices anymore. And we wanna really think about, the, we call this the big three, the cytotoxicity, sensitization, and irritation. I think about these as the most valuable data points because if you look down this chart, you'll notice that every single medical device basically has to have this information. And so when I think about well, what would be most valuable for clients for raw material suppliers is this information because this is the foundation of saying, yes, you are starting with a good biocompatible material. And so if you are a company that performs USP class six and some ISO testing, I would say, you know, consider switching to just doing ISO if your clientele is heavily in the medical device industry. Of course, if you also supply to pharmaceuticals, then USP class six is still relatable. But if it's just the medical device industry, these three tests are just more applicable and it also saves unnecessary animal lives for that acute systemic and that implantation test. Um, sensitization and irritation are also animal lives or uh, in vivo tests done on animals, but I'm going to discuss some specific options for those that may help, um, that would help eliminate still even more animals that are used for the screening. So because these are the most important tests, I just want to go into them very briefly so that you could understand what would be required from a testing standpoint. So for cytotoxicity, I would highly recommend an MEM elution. For most products, that's going to be the most appropriate test, um, most raw materials. And you can see we don't need very much of this. If it's sold like in a square or a block, 120 centimeters squared, and if it's in pellets, something irregular that we cannot measure, four grams is enough to run the assay. Um, we do it in about four days. It's very quick. We run these tests six days a week. Um, and then it's just, you know, six days for the final report. So very quick turn on that. You can see what the usual problems are for this test. Latex, natural rubber, silver, copper. Um, so those types of things will tend to produce failures. Um, and so we can talk some different strategies if your raw material includes some of these items. Um, but if not, and it just, you know, maybe it's, again, I keep referencing polypropylene, um, but if it's something like a more common polymer, we would expect it to be okay in cytotoxicity testing. This is the grading category or criteria for cytotoxicity. Um, just to let you know, get a little help in interpreting your report and your results that you hope to see a score of two or less. Uh, and I would say for a raw material supplier, you really wanna be sitting around zero or one because manufacturing is additive and depending if they're adding colorants and EO sterilization and other processes in the manufacture of the final device, if they're starting with something that's already borderline at a two, there's a good chance the final device will jump up to a three. And um, so we wanna be thoughtful of that and, um, you know, make sure that 
we're representing a true biocompatible um, raw material by staying in that zero to one range. So something to consider if you are seeing twos in your material for cytotoxicity, that's an additional consideration might be needed to think about the process uh, of the raw material. Irritation testing. Right now, the most widely accepted irritation test is intracutaneous reactivity test. Um, this is an extraction test, um, where it is performed in rabbits. Uh, it does take about four to five weeks, and we would require 240 centimeters squared. So you'll notice this is double the cytotoxicity sample requirement. Um, so we require at least two samples, and that's because we run this test and a polar and a non-polar solvent. So we would do it in a saline and a sesame oil or a cottonseed oil solvent. This test is um, relatively short as far as duration goes. Uh, after the 72-hour extraction, the extract is injected just subcutaneously in the animals, and they're observed for 72 hours and given scores on redness and swelling. And then that, those scores are compared between test articles and negative control articles. And then there's a comparison drawn, and you hope to fall below a one or less when your um, material is compared to the negative control. The good news about this test is that there is an in vitro irritation option that I highly recommend and is perfect for screening of materials. So where that previous method, intracutaneous uh, reactivity, that was based on animals. This is actually based on using reconstructed human epidermis. So meaning we've grown human tissue in these small inserts uh, where we can run and simulate an irritation response in the lab this way without using any animals. And this is um, human skin that can be pulled from a one-time donation that from surgeries where the skin is already removed. And we think about, you know, like plastic surgery or circumcision um, procedures. So it's not like we're asking for donors, it's just part of the surgery where it's donated for this tube. So this test, um, similar turnaround time, four to five weeks. It's similar in cost to the in vitro or the uh, rabbit irritation study and also requires two samples for the testing. And here's just an outline of the test. Um, where instead of exposing to an animal, we expose the extract to the tissue, and then we rinse the tissues and expose them to MTT, which is a dye, which I've um, identified the name at the bottom, quite lengthy, so you can understand why we say MTT. And um, after this dye exposure, what we see is that the tissues, so MTT starts out yellow, and then once it's exposed to the tissues, if the tissues are alive, the mitochondria will convert that um, dye into a form of an salt. So it'll go from yellow to purple. And then we extract that purple um, with some isopropyl alcohol and read the color change on a spectrophotometer so we can understand cell survival versus cell death, which is an indicator of the irritation response. And so you see a result like this uh, data will be generated for the final report in this format. Um, and on the graph on the right-hand side, you can see that we have a red line at 50% viability. So what here, we're just measuring, again, a comparison of cell survival. So if you are over the 50% survival rate, then you're a non-irritant. And if the product is below that 50%, then it is categorized as an irritant. So we still will do the R38 GHS categorization, but we cannot do category three where it's a determinant of a mild irritant. Um, but we're not finding, you know, medical devices that sit in that range typically. We're either, you know, over or above that line pretty consistently. So it's a great option for screening raw materials and is very useful for medical device companies to understand uh, if they're starting with a biocompatible material. So on to sensitization. There's a few different options for sensitization testing. This is one of those scenarios where I said, you know, in the standard, there could be three or four different test options. So in the standard for sensitization, there's um, at least three methods listed right now. Um, and we highly recommend the guinea pig maximization study. 
So this is an in vitro or in vivo study, meaning it is done in animals. All of these three are. And right now we haven't come to quite a full agreement on an in vitro sensitization method, but it is in the works. Um, but this is very useful information. It does take nine weeks and six samples, so it's quite lengthy and extensive. But <clears throat> if you think about a sensitization response, we're looking for that, that exposure, and then you have to have a response after the fact. So it takes a long time because we have to give the animals time to actually generate a response if there is one um, that we will see, like a physiological response. So um, that is the highest recommended test at this point. Um, and hoping to roll out some in vitro options later. Some other things to consider that I didn't mention is that if you have a high cardiovascular market that you distribute to, then I would recommend including a hemolysis testing. And you could do, I would do an indirect hemolysis where it's just based on an extract. And that takes about four devices and a couple of weeks to run. So that's another thing to consider in your battery of testing. Something else we offer in the form of a written certificate is a certificate of biocompatibility. <clears throat> so you can imagine, you know, maybe what your information would look like here, where you identify material, um, clarifying that the statement of biocompatibility is only going to apply to this material in the form it was tested in. And then the specification of the test article. This is something I mentioned before, always curious what happened to the material before it was tested, how was it handled? So maybe it'll be sterilized, maybe some colorants would be included as well. Um, and you can identify at what percent those would be added at so that we can ensure the applicability of the results to the distributed material to the manufacturer. And then we just summarize the, the tests performed with a conclusion where we're careful at the bottom to state that you know the final finished device still has to be assessed by the manufacturer. So that does release you as the raw material supplier for any you know, accountability at that point as far as assessing patient safety, but you are helping your clients understand, hey, we've assessed the material and we do know, you know it's not eliciting these responses when, as it leaves our facility. Um, so it's great information to provide. Okay, I wanted to take a minute to talk about changes. Um, this is something that we assess a lot in, um, in our industry, particularly in my field, where I will see you know, a lot of medical device manufacturers trying to assess changes. And sometimes the changes that are occurring are not occurring at their facility, but happening at the raw material level um, with their providers. So I wanna talk about what is a change, um, and think about how that's defined within your company, um, and also how those decisions on why changes are being made. You know, is it based on feedback? Is it based on industry-driven from customer requests, uh, the science of the material, those types of things? It's important to have that documented and noted for even a raw material supplier because that becomes tribal knowledge that stays with those who are involved with assessing the change during that time. Um, but it's important that that's documented so those down the road understand where that change is coming from. And then it's properly communicated to, of course, the clients as well. And then also just some thoughts on how the proposed change will affect some end considerations for your clients, sterility, effectiveness, you know, biocompatibility, how is it change, how easy it is to clean. Not that you have to assess these, but if the reason for why you're making the change is not substantial enough, you'll want to think about down the road impacts that could possibly happen. So I want to give an example of something that occurred with one of our clients to help, you know, clarify this, these situations. Um, so a client of ours was receiving a glass raw material and they were testing it to screen it when it came in for cytotoxicity. So every lot of this material that they purchased, they screened for cytotoxicity. They'd been passing with zeros for years. All of a sudden they got a lot and it was re received a score of two. Of course, we had them do some repeat testing, compare it again, kept getting a two. 
So they asked their raw material supplier, did you make a change? And the answer was no, they have not changed that raw material. And then they discussed these results. So what they found out after discussing with the raw material supplier is that somebody on the line said, we want to make our material cleaner. And when we say cleaner, meaning we wanna reduce the amount of bacteria that's present on this when it leaves our facility. This raw material has a lot of um, handling by workers at the facility. So they decided to incorporate the use of gloves. And unfortunately, in this case, they used latex gloves, which latex gloves will leave particles all over any material. And it raised that cytotoxicity from a zero to a two. And of course, that's absolutely unacceptable because it's latex, which is an allergen. So, and that raw material, once in a medical device, would not have been labeled for that because according to the manufacturer, there's no latex used in the device. So just some things to consider. Um, we've also had companies add extra IPA rinses on products and IPA does not evaporate off of polymers. We still get high levels of residuals that can be present. And so that's a change, even though it may be making it cleaner or a reduction of bacteria, which is good. We want clean devices. It just needs to be thoughtful in development of that process to make sure it's being done because it's needed and that it's being assessed down the end to make sure it's not contributing in a negative or impacting that material in a negative way at the end. So just a quick overview and summary on the presentation today. So for ISO 10093 part one, the important takeaway point is to gather physical and chemical information and that that's a requirement that starts with raw materials. So the better information that's provided up front really helps your clients in the back end. Uh, for the second part where we reviewed CM, the CMR requirement for medical from the medical device regulation, a CMR certificate is required for devices sold in the EU, but again, for invasive devices, not just those worn on intact skin. Who is responsible for the testing? That is the final device manufacturer. And then for the last part, what information and testing on raw materials is useful for medical device companies? Absolutely the big three from ISO 10993, cytotoxicity, sensitization, and irritation. And then of course, consider hemolysis testing if you market to a cardiovascular industry. So where can you go from here? I just, I always like to leave some action where you can go to if this piqued your interest or you want to understand more. If you want more information on biocompatibility in general, we have several um, webinars and outlines available. So you can start with just our outline of how we approach biocompatibility on our website and go from there. If you're interested in any of our offerings that I've presented here, please feel free to email these inquiries to our consulting at nelsonlabs.com email. This goes to my entire team. So that way, if I'm bogged down, you won't be delayed in your project. And we can get you started right away with one of our experts. And if you want to watch more webinars on biocompatibility, we have those available through our on-demand webinars link on our website. Thank you for joining me today, and I appreciate your time, and I hope to hear from you.